Well, thank you. One, one more reason why not to trust Wikipedia. <laughs> it wasn't accurate. Um, cra crazy is, uh, is a good word, but crazy for the gospel. Uh, Paul, I think, I seem to recall, um, talked, a bit, talked about being out of his mind for Christ's sake. Now, that's just plain old being out of your mind. I'm not, I'm not denying that. Now, as I was pondering uh, yesterday, last night, this morning, which text would be most appropriate to follow on uh, from things I said yesterday, but also realizing that not all of you were able to be here yesterday, and, and therefore there would be no, uh, th that this sermon would stand alone uh, as a, as a one-off sermon, even if you didn't hear what I had to say yesterday. So, trying to do both of those things. And I'm going to, uh, I'm going to go to uh, Hebrews chapter 9. So, while you're looking for Hebrews uh, chapter 9, let me, let me thank you. I, I, think, I think this is the fifth occasion on which I've been here. And uh, it's beginning to feel like home. Um, I, don't, I don't envy your your cold weather. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a southern boy now, and um, this, this is a little cold for me. Uh, but it is uh, always a pleasure to be here. I've followed your trajectory as a congregation uh, over the last 10, 15 years, and uh, been amazed by what God has done here and the work of the Holy Spirit so evident uh, in you as a congregation and in your leadership uh, in particular, and I regard Stan as a dear friend, and uh, it's a joy to be back here again. Now, Hebrews chapter 9, let's read the entire chapter together. Now, even the first covenant had regulations for worship and an earthly place of holiness. For a tent was prepared, the first section in which were the lampstand and the table and the bread of presence. It is called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a second section called the most holy place, having the golden altar of incense, and the ark of the covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden urn holding the manna, and Aaron's staff that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. Above it were the cherubim of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. These preparations having thus been made. The priests go regularly into the first section performing their ritual duties, but into the second only the high priest goes, and he but once a year, and not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the unintentional sins of the people. By this, the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holy places is not yet opened as long as the first section is still standing, which is symbolic for the present age. According to this arrangement, gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper, but deal only with food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until the time of Reformation. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, He entered once for all into the holy places not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of His own blood, 
thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Therefore, He is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. For where a will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. For a will takes effect only at death, since it is not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. Therefore, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant that God commanded for you. And in the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tent and all the vessels used in worship. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Thus, it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites. But the heavenly things themselves, with better sacrifices, than these. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer Himself repeatedly, as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood not his own, for then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man to die once and after that comes judgment, so Christ having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for Him. Amen. May God bless to us the reading of His holy and inerrant Word. It might be that the book of Hebrews is your favorite New Testament book. It's something that would surprise me if that were the case, but it might just be that Hebrews is your favorite New Testament book. It shares, along with the book of Revelation, the use of word pictures, powerful word pictures. Uh, the book of Revelation using war images to make the point that Christ is victorious and will win this battle. The book of Hebrews using pictures drawn out of the ritual and ceremony of the Old Testament, largely perhaps unfamiliar to us, but deeply familiar to the readers, the original readers of the book of Hebrews. What is the book of Hebrews about? Well, in one sentence, that Jesus saves to the uttermost. 
them that come unto Him by faith. That Jesus saves to the uttermost them that come unto Him by faith. This book is all about Christ. From the very beginning to the very end, it is all about Christ. I suggested uh, yesterday that there may be a background here to the book of Hebrews that we need to be familiar with, and that the original readers were those who had been affected by a particular group in intertestamental Judaism known as the Essenes. The Essenes are more popularly known as the Qumran community, perhaps more popularly still known as the Dead Sea Scrolls people. And I was saying yesterday that some of you might have been, and there was one yesterday, I think, who had been on a trip to Israel, and part of that trip invariably is a trip down to the Dead Sea. And as you're going down, perhaps on a journey to Masada, the southern end of the Dead Sea, uh, you will stop halfway down at this uh, excavation site of the Qumran community, a small, what might appear to us today as a small little village, uh, walled up uh, on all sides, nestling against a, a, a range of mountains in what looks like complete and utter desert. And of course, it's accessible today by roads uh, leading from Jerusalem down on the western side of uh, the Dead Sea, but in the time of Jesus, it was a most inaccessible place for very particular reasons. That the Essenes had withdrawn from the world, and they had drawn, withdrawn from largely what they felt was a deviation from Judaism that was expressed elsewhere, and particularly in Jerusalem. And they had formed their own little community, a sect, if you like. And uh, they uh, had an enormous amount of interest in a particular part of the Old Testament, the prophecy of the New Covenant in Jeremiah 31. If you have your Bibles open, uh, and it's open to chapter 9, if you glance back at chapter 8 at the end of it, and especially if you've got a, a, an ESV, it's indented for you in the form uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, poetry, uh, and uh, you see it's a quotation from Jeremiah 31. Uh, almost the s entire second half of uh, Hebrews chapter 8 is a quotation of Jeremiah 31. Uh, the author of Hebrews is correcting this Essene uh, view of the new covenant. What was the Essene view of the new covenant? Well, basically, it was the old covenant just spruced up a little. It was, it was the old covenant cleaned up a little, perhaps with a few more additions, perhaps with the addition of the name of uh, Jesus, but it was still essentially the old covenant with all of its uh, ritual and, and, and all of its uh, legal uh, obligations. And, and the author of Hebrews is addressing that issue. What is the understanding of the new covenant? The new covenant that dawns at the coming of Christ that is made effective at the death and resurrection of Christ and the coming of the Holy Spirit on uh, the day of Pentecost. And uh, here in chapter 9, he gives you the answer to that. And I want us to think about it together, and I want us to think along three uh, particular lines of thought. Uh, the argumentation in chapter 9 can get a little complicated, particularly uh, the reference to the last will and testament uh, section beginning there in uh, verses 16 and 17 and so on. Uh, but uh, uh, what the author of Hebrews is essentially saying here is, uh, is actually quite simple. He's saying, first of all, that Jesus minister, that the ministry of Jesus is entirely different both in its location and in its frequency. This is one of the distinctive features of the new covenant, that the ministry of Jesus is exercised in a completely different location and with an entirely different frequency. And then let's explore that a little. Uh, you'll need to have uh, Hebrews 9 open before you, and uh, just follow with me as uh, the author uh, begins in the first five verses, and he talks about 
Old Testament worship. He talks about tabernacle worship and later temple worship. But he talks about the structure, the architecture, the layout of the tabernacle. He talks about the outer section, the holy place, and then a curtain, and then the inner part, the, the most holy place in the outer section. Uh, there were priests, and, the, and these priests uh, would be there on a daily basis, and they would be offering uh, their sacrifices and performing their, their ritual and so on. And then uh, behind the second cu curtain, in the most holy place, and there are certain pieces of furniture there, and there's uh, the golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides uh, with gold, and which was a golden urn holding the, um, the, the manna and Aaron's uh, staff that budded, and, and of course the Ten Commandments, the tables of the, of the covenant. And into this section, the Holy of Holies, a high priest would enter, uh, wearing the garb of the high priest, a high priest drawn from a particular tribe of, uh, of Israel, and uh, bells around uh, the, the garments and so on, and he would enter uh, taking with him uh, the blood of the covenant. Uh, and uh, on Yom Kippur, on, on the Day of Atonement, as, uh, as the high point of a, of a, a ritual, a feast, that would have lasted for several days, uh, the high priest would enter, and he would enter once a year uh, and offer a, a, this sacrifice, the blood of this uh, sacrifice. And then, of course, the whole point of this is to say that this was repeated, just as, just as in the outer section of the, of the tabernacle, the work of these priests, it was repeated on a daily basis. The, there was a rotation of priests. Some of them would stay uh, in the city for a while, and then they would, they would have leave and they would go um, home. And uh, so many of them, of course, would live outside of the city, and perhaps a day's journey, perhaps a couple of days' journey away from Jerusalem. Uh, and there would be a rotation of these Levitical uh, priests. But the point of it is that it was repeated. It was, it was done over and over and over. And the high priest, similarly, although it was only once a year. It was again repeated annually every year. The high priest would take the blood of the covenant into the uh, most holy place and offer it. But there was something about it that was, that was, uh, that was uh, never finished, that, that never reached a resolution, that never accomplished its, its goal and aim. It was, it was constantly falling short. It was designed to do so. The Holy Spirit, verse 8, the Holy Spirit indicating that the way into the holy places is not yet opened as long as the first section is still, is still standing. What was taking place here? Jesus' uh, Jesus ministry is entirely different from this ministry. And yet, and yet, it is a fulfillment of this ministry. There is a there is a continuity, these, these, uh, these rituals that the priests would perform, these rituals that the high priest would perform on the Day of Atonement, they were, they were copies. They were, they were shadows of the reality to which these rituals pointed, the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, the coming of the fulfillment of all these types and, and shadows and, and, and copies. You notice, as he says in, uh, in verse uh, 12, for example, he entered in once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, uh, but by means of his own blood. And then in verse 13, if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer, referenced in Numbers chapter 19 and the so-called laws of purification, sanctify for the purification of the flesh. You see, there was something, there was something about this ritual, uh, the slaughter of animals, the slaughter of bulls and goats and, and, a, and a heifer and so on, and the, and the need for cleansing. What did it do? What did it accomplish? Well, it accomplished something that was external. It accomplished something that was local. It, it, it accomplished something that was of this world. And the point that Hebrews 9 wants to make is that Jesus entered into the holy place in heaven itself, in, in, in reality itself, the, the blood of bulls and goats. It, it could never take away sin. 
It was unworthy. It was powerless. Only the blood of Christ can forgive sin. The blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin. We sing that hymn. Not all the blood of not all the blood of beasts on Jewish altars slain can give this guilty conscience peace and wash away the stain. Well, there it is. I want us to see here there's, there's a sense of continuity, there's a sense of unity. We were talking yesterday about the covenant of grace. And we understand that covenant of grace operating in both dispensations, in both administrations, in both the era of the Old Covenant and also, of course, in the era of the New Covenant. There is one way of salvation. What is that way of salvation? It is by faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. It is by grasping hold of the promise that God assures us that in His Son there is forgiveness of sins. But under the Old Covenant, Jesus Jesus was there, but He was there in copy. He was there in, in shadow. He was there, he was there in symbol. It's like Augustine uh, depicted it you know, when he spoke of the Old Testament as a room full of furniture, but the lights are out, and you, you, can't, you can't see it. The furniture is there. The structure is there. Uh, there is sin, and sin needs to be cleansed, and there is guilt, and guilt needs to be propitiated, and that needs to be done by blood, because without the shedding of blood, verse 22, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So there, there's the principle, there's the lesson, but it's in shadow. It's the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of, a, of an heifer sprinkling the unclean, and these are powerless. These are unworthy to, to forgive sin. They couldn't forgive sin. The very perpetuation of the ritual, the, the very repetition of the ritual was itself indicative that it was still waiting and anticipating the fulfillment, what he calls the, um, the day of uh, the, the, the day of reformation. Uh, look at verse uh, 10. These washings, these regulations for the body imposed until the time of reformation. What's he talking about? Well, he's talking about the coming of Jesus. He's talking about the dawning of the new covenant. It's a reformation. The Old Testament rituals, they were anticipatory. They, 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 they weren't permanent. But when Jesus comes, he comes once. Notice how many times he says, once for all. He uses this Greek word, hapax. Once for all. Jesus died once for all. There is no repetition of the crucifixion of Jesus. That's uh, our argument, of course, with the Roman Catholic understanding of the Mass, that there is a repetition of the sacrifice of Christ in uh, the classic understanding of uh, the meaning of the, of the Catholic view of the Mass. For, that's, that's, that's our quarrel with it. It's a denial of the once for all sacrifice of Jesus. Jesus died once. He doesn't need to die again. We don't need another Savior. We don't need another Calvary. We don't need someone else to shed His blood. Jesus has shed His blood. So the ministry of Jesus is entirely different in its location. It's not, it's not simply on earth. It's not simply that we could enter into the holy place on earth when the curtain was rent asunder. Because what happened in the providence of God? How did God demonstrate the end of the earthly shadow and copy? Well, it was destroyed. The, the temple was destroyed because the new has come. The new that cleanses, the new that cleanses the conscience, the new that grants forgiveness of sins. So that when we believe and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, we may be absolutely, absolutely certain, absolutely assured that our sins, though they be red like crimson, in Jesus Christ they are as white as snow. So that's the first thing. Jesus ministers in an entirely different location and, and according to an entirely different frequency. And then he makes a second point, that Jesus cleanses by offering a better sacrifice with better effects. A better sacrifice with better effects. You know, look at verse 23. Thus it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. 
We need a better sacrifice than the sacrifice of bulls and goats and the ashes of, an heifer, of, a, of a heifer. What is that sacrifice? Well, of course, the answer of the book of Hebrews is it is the sacrifice of Christ. It is the sacrifice of, 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 the, Son of, of the Son of God. How much more, verse 14, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit, he's talking about Calvary, and he's talking about the ministry of the Holy Spirit upholding the Lord Jesus, enabling him to fulfill the covenant of works, enab enabling him to offer a spotless sacrifice, a, 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 a seamless sacrifice, without spot or blemish or any such thing. He'd, he'd obeyed the law in all of its detail to offer a perfect sacrifice, the sacrifice of himself as a lamb, the lamb of God, the lamb that is typified in the Abraham and Isaac story, the lamb that is typified in the Passover ritual, the lamb that is spoken of in the servant songs of uh, the prophet Isaiah, the lamb of God that John the Baptist alluded to at the time of Jesus' uh, baptism. Behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This lamb who, who sits in revelation enthroned on the majesty on high, on the throne of the universe, there sits a lamb with his throat cut. That's the picture that John gives you in the book of Revelation. Who is the one who is upholding the universe, the one who is slain for us, whose blood was shed for us? When the fullness of time, when the fullness of time had come, this time of uh, reformation, as he calls it in uh, verse, uh, in verse uh, 10, uh, this, this anticipatory moment, uh, what he calls in verse 9, symbolic for the present age, uh, the age in which the author of Hebrews is writing, the turning point between the old covenant and the new covenant, the time of reformation, when the Spirit comes on the day of Pentecost, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, made under the law, in order to redeem them who, uh, who are under the law. Uh, Galatians 4.4, 4, in the fullness of time. He's not talking about Roman roads and Roman civilization and, and the fact that everybody spoke uh, uh, Greek or Latin, uh, the lingua franca of the entire empire and made evangelism easy. All of those things are true, but that's not what Paul is speaking about in Galatians 4.4. 4. He's talking about the fullness of time as, as the anticipation of the old covenant is waiting for the dawning of the new age, the dawning of the coming of Christ when the fullness of time in God's redemptive purposes had dawned. So these Old Testament sacrifices were, they were types. Uh, they were ceremonial. They were visual aids pointing, uh, pointing uh, forwards. But the whole point of them is that they couldn't, they couldn't cleanse the conscience. Uh, look at verse uh, 13. If the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh. It's something outward. What did, what did Old Testament ritual and Old Testament sacrifice, what did it accomplish? Well, it accomplished something temporary. It accomplished something outward. But it couldn't cleanse the conscience. It couldn't cleanse the conscience, purify our conscience. Verse 14, that's the issue. Old Testament sacrifices couldn't purify the conscience. Well, we've just passed through Reformation Day. What's at the heart of the Protestant Reformation? The issue of conscience. Uh, we think of Martin Luther trying to earn that righteousness that he thought God required of him when he read Romans chapter 1 and verses 16 and 17. For therein, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for therein is the, is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. And he thought that righteousness was something that he had to earn and achieve. And because he couldn't earn it, and the more he tried, and the, when he became an Augustinian monk and so on, and went through periods of self-flagellation, and the more he tried, the more his conscience condemned him. Until he saw that, that, that glorious moment when he saw that the righteousness that God uh, demands is a righteousness that he gives freely by faith in Jesus Christ. The just shall live by faith. 
We saw it in the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis 15 and verse 6. The just shall live by faith. The righteous, when you believe in Jesus, when you trust in Jesus, you are reckoned to be righteous. Your conscience is cleansed. Your guilt is gone. You're reckoned a covenant keeper. God sees you, and what does he see? He sees perfection. He sees the righteous, spotless robe of Jesus Christ. There's no more ritual. There's no more bloody sacrifices. There's, there's, there's no more ceremony. There's no more type and shadow because the reality has come. The fullness has come. What can wash away our sin? There's a great question. That's the question that every one of us needs to have an answer for this morning. What can wash away your sin? Do you think the sacrifice of a, a goat will do that? Do you think that slaying a heifer will do that? And the book of Hebrews says it cannot. It cannot cleanse the conscience. It's a type. It's a shadow. It's pointing. It's anticipatory. It's waiting for the day of reformation. It's waiting for the fulfillment. It's waiting for the coming of Jesus. But in and of itself, it is thoroughly inadequate. It cannot do it. What can wash away our sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. You see, these people in, in uh, Hebrews, this Hebrew community, if they were affected as we think they were by the Essenes, they simply wanted to go back to Moses. They thought the new covenant would be going back to Moses. That the, that the nation of Israel had drifted and, and, and had lost its moorings and it needed to go back to Moses. It needed to go back to Sinai. It needed to go back to the Levitical system. It needed to go back to the types and shadows. And, and therein lay salvation. And therein lay reformation. And the author of Hebrews is, well, he's, he's aiming a bullseye here at that notion. And he's saying that's entirely wrong. That's entirely false. Jesus has come. And he's fulfilled all of what the old covenant was anticipating. All of what it was shadowing. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Well, is that your testimony this morning? What a great thing it is to be able to say that. That Jesus cleanses me of all my sin, all of it, my past sins, my, my, my terrible record, things I might have done as a teenager, things I've done since, things that keep me awake at night, things I don't even want to talk about. Jesus cleanses me from it all. He washes it all away. Though, though our sins be red like crimson in, in Jesus Christ, they are as white as snow. Well, there's a third thing. Not only does Jesus minister in an, an entirely different location and according to an entirely different schedule, Jesus cleanses by an offering, offering a better sacrifice with better effects. And then thirdly, Jesus mediates a better covenant with better provisions. A better covenant with, with better provisions. That's one of the ways in which the new covenant is described, isn't it? It's a better covenant. It's a new covenant, but it's a better covenant. Because it actually accomplishes something. Now, there's a little nuance and a little twist here in verses 16 and 17. You have, at least in the ESV, for where a will is involved. And then in verse 17, uh, for a will takes effect only at death. It's talking about a, a, a last will and testament, that kind of will. It's actually the same word as covenant. It's the Greek word uh, diatheki, and the, there's, a, there's some discussion as to how to translate this word. Uh, the point that the ESV is translating this as will is because in a covenant, you'd, a covenant is effective even though there mightn't be a death. You think of a marriage. A marriage is a covenant. It is, a, it is a binding relationship with promises and obligations. That's how I defined covenant yesterday. But you don't have to die in order to make that effective. Now, a marriage might kill you, but you don't have to die in order to make that marriage effective. But the point he's now making is, it, it's, something, it's something a little different. In, in order for the provisions of a will to be made effective, you actually have to die. You, you might have a will. You might be expecting to inherit from a will, but unless the person dies, you're not going to inherit it. That's the point that he's making. And Jesus has died in order, in order that that which he has willed, that which he has written down in his last will and testament, is made effective to us. 
uh, three and a half years ago uh, in uh, First Presbyterian Church in Colombia uh, when the senior minister then was uh, Sinclair Ferguson and I had just come on staff uh, to be the evening preacher and then uh, Sinclair had announced his retirement and uh, he preached a series of sermons uh, before he retired and he made, I remember one Sunday morning he used this illustration and uh, it was one of those illustrations uh, that people were caught sideways by. Uh, he talked, uh, Dr. Ferguson has a love for Rembrandt, uh, the painter. Loves his paintings. I was in uh, uh, St. Petersburg uh, this past summer and uh, went to the museum in St. Petersburg where there are 21 uh, Rembrandt, original Rembrandt paintings. And uh, I, I, I couldn't help it. I sent him a text and, and a photograph or two. You're allowed to take pictures of these. And, uh, and, and I, I just loved uh, the envy that I could feel uh, <laughs> that I, I was this close to a Rembrandt painting. Well, on Sunday morning a few years ago, uh, he told the congregation of First Presbyterian Church that his family owned two Rembrandt paintings. Uh, the painting of Paul and the painting of uh, Jesus stilling the storm. And he said, uh, he had talked to Dorothy, his wife, and uh, they had decided that uh, when he died, uh, he had written it into his will uh, that the church would inherit these two paintings when he died. And uh, you're foolish enough to fall into this as the congregation in First Presbyterian Church were foolish enough because you could have heard a pin drop. And uh, some of the deacons especially were trying to think, well, how much is a Rembrandt worth? <laughs> and not just one, but two. And then after a pause, he said, but they're only copies. <laughs> but they're prints. He said, they're worth probably $100. He was trying to make a point. They're Rembrandt paintings. And, and unless you walk up close to it, you, 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 you might think they, they actually look like the original, but they're not originals. They're just prints. They're just copies. They're worth $100 maybe, and that probably for the frame. Well, that's the point that the author of Hebrews is making here. These Old Testament sacrifices, they, they, they were replicas they were prints. They were copies. But they weren't the real thing. They had no value in and of themselves apart from an outward value. They, they, they could purify to the, to the purification of the flesh outwardly. They could bring some outward reformation, but they couldn't cleanse the heart. They couldn't forgive sin. They couldn't cleanse the conscience. They, they couldn't get rid of guilt. They were pointing forward to the need for the coming of the one sacrifice of Christ who offered himself without spot or blemish or any such thing. Now, to what end? Jesus mediates a better covenant with better provisions, but to what end? Let me pick up something that the author says in verse 14 to cleanse, to purify our conscience from dead works, from dead works. Do you remember how Paul talks in 2 Corinthians 3 about the old covenant as a ministry of death? He's making a, a, a relative contrast, of course, in absolute terms. But the works that were performed under the old covenant, well, they were dead works. To serve the living God. What's, what's the point of all that Jesus has done for us? That we might serve Him. That within the covenant of grace, as I was saying yesterday, there are corresponding obligations on our part, consequent obligations on our part. We're saved to serve. We're cleansed to serve. We're forgiven to serve. We're pardoned in order to serve. To serve him with a clear conscience. To serve him not to win his favor, but to serve him because we have been forgiven. 
because it is our instinct now to serve Him, because we're indwelt by the personal representative agent of the Lord Jesus who constantly reminds us of all that He has achieved on our behalf. What a, what a glorious thing. What a beautiful thing. What a wonderful thing it is to be a Christian. Can you say that this morning? What a wonderful thing it is to be a Christian. What a wonderful thing it is to live on this side of redemptive history, on the fulfillment side, on the new covenant side. We're not, we're not walking about in the dark. We've walked into the light, the full light of the gospel as it is personified in Jesus Christ. Not all the blood of beasts on Jewish altars slain can give this guilty conscience peace and wash away the stain. Only, only Jesus can do that. And He has done it in majesty, in, in fullness, once for all, never to be repeated again. Well, what glory, what wonder. Let's pray together. Father, we thank You. We have just scratched the surface of this extraordinary chapter that reminds us of the enormous privileges that are ours in the new covenant, that the shadow has given way to sunshine, and the type and copy has given way to the original manuscript itself. Father, we thank You. Thank You for the assurance that is ours in the gospel, and help us now to see as a consequence of all that You have done that we are saved in order to serve You with all of our hearts. For Jesus' sake, amen.